let's begin. So we're going to continue with polar coordinates. We're going to draw some more polar curves and compute areas, and then maybe talk about conic sections a little bit. So I guess to finish up, we'll, we'll sort of kill two birds with one stone, and I'll give you some area problems, and then basically um, I'll just make I'll just make sure we sketch it while finding the area. Um, so here's an example, and I gave you the general area formula, right? So we know that in polar coordinates, what was it? It was a half r squared mu theta. Right, this is a to b. And notice that these are where your angles are coming from. This is if your r is, if you solve for r as a function of theta when you're given a polar curve. Um, one thing I'm not sure I might have given you is the area between curves. Or curves. Let's say, for example, in the xy plane, I have one polar curve doing its thing over here. That small r equals f of theta. And I have another polar curve also doing this thing over, over here. Let me call that big R. And if my angle goes from, say, theta 1 to theta 2, and I care about the area in between them, then it kind of works just as how you think it would work. You take the outer area minus the inner area, and that's basically how that would work. So this would mean that the area in between these curves would just be from theta 1 to theta 2 of 1 half the big R squared minus 1 half the little r squared. Which, you, you know, a half is a constant you can factor it up. <coughs> um, but let's actually do so, an example now. Find the area enclosed by r equals 2 plus 2 cosine theta includes h. So remember when we we're doing polar coordinates and we want to sketch something, something that's kind of strange, um, what we do is we First, sketch the trig function, and then we translate that to the xy plane. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I want to sketch what what r equals two plus two cosine theta looks like. So what that means is I take the graph of two cosine theta, I shift it up two. So there is the new baseline is draw it bigger. So the new baseline is 2, but then cosine is stretched by 2, so the amplitude is also 2, so it goes up to 4 and down to 0. And it's also a regular cosine, so I know it's just the usual deal. comes in four sections, where this is pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. And then I just draw the cosine graph. It starts here, then goes in the middle, and goes in the bottom, and goes in the middle. Uh, and so that's the graph. But this is in the um, R theta plane. So now, let's remember how we actually did this when we wanted to go to the xy plane. We're going to do it in terms of circles. So we look at all the, the y values that show up, all the r values. These r represents our distance from the origin. And there are some convenience points to look at here, 0, 2, and 4. 
So what that means is you basically draw a circle of radius 2. And that means that's a, that, that marks where the distance from the origin is 2 and the circle of radius 4. That marks where the distance from the origin is 4. You'll draw in your angles. Again, these angles are going to be the very convenient ones. These angles are going to be given by the period over 4, which we discussed before. And so the angles I care about here are just theta equals 0, um, theta equals pi over 2, theta equals pi, theta equals 3 pi over 2, and theta equals 2 pi, which is equivalent to 0. And now we start to plot them. So when my theta is 0, my distance from the origin is at 4, so I'm on the circle of radius 4 when theta is equal to 0. As theta moves to pi over 2, my distance from the origin is now 2. So I'm going to jump from the circle of radius 4 to the circle of radius 2 when my angle hits pi over 2. So that means I'm going to hit this point here. So it goes over. And these are trick functions, so you're always kind of tracing the direction in a counterclockwise direction. Notice here when I hit pi, my distance from the origin is what? Zero, which means here's the angle pi. I should be here, so this is going to go. Moving to three pi over two, my distance from the origin is now two, so I'm going to jump back to the circle of radius two. And now moving to 2 pi, I'm back on the circle of radius 4. So it's kind of like a sideways heart. In fact, it's, it's called a cardio. So when you're making these curves, mm -hmm. um, like I accidentally went in to go to the 3 pi over 2. There's a reason why you do it in a certain way. That makes yes. Sense. If your r is positive, you're always going towards the angle. Okay. Um, the only way you kind of go that way is if your r is negative, which means you're going away from it. You also want to always be curling in the counterclockwise fashion, because theta increases in a counterclockwise fashion, mm -hmm. so your curve is always being traced out in that fashion. But at the same time, depending on whether you're going towards an angle or away from an angle, that depends on the value of r. Our r here is always positive or zero, so I'm never actually, I'm never actually running away from any angle. So if that point at pi was below zero, we would go in a different way? Yeah, so I don't, I might have a question like that. Um, uh, but let's say if the trig function did this, then what that would mean is that it would start here, it will hit zero at some point, and then instead of going back there, I'll go away from the angle and come back. It might cause something like that, like a little loop. So usually when you hit the origin, it means you hit... Usually when you hit zero, it means you hit the origin, and if you have a little loop, it means like you've created a loop. Um, so it, it might be better. But anyway, the question is now to find the area inside of this thing. And notice that I traced out the entire figure by going from zero to two pi. Um, so again, you always have a couple options here. You can notice that, one, it's symmetric, so you can only use 0 to pi and double the answer. All that stuff still applies. All your intuition from intuition still kind of applies in that way. But here, it's, it's, I might as well just do 0 to 2 pi. Right? That, that gives me the full revolution, which traces out the entire figure. And then I do 1 half r squared d theta. And that's going to be 0 to 2 pi, 1 half times 2 plus 2 cosine theta squared d theta. And computing that integral will actually give you the area of that inside that polar curve. And I think, I believe that was 6 pi. At this point, that shouldn't be any trouble for you to do. You're right, you foil out, expand the parentheses. When you get a cosine squared, you use the half angle formula, and eventually you get the 6 pi.
find the area inside the inner loop of r equals 1 minus 2 sine theta. Include a sketch. Here's a sine function, it's shifted up 1, so the new baseline is 1. The amplitude is 2. Right? So it means from 1, I go up 2 to 3. I go down 2, it hits minus 1. So that's my guy. Cuts into four sections. Because it's a regular sine graph, the angle is not being altered. So this is, again, pi over 2, pi through pi over 2, and <coughs> 2 pi. And now I want to graph a negative sine graph. The coefficient of sine is negative, which means it's upside down. So it'll start at the middle, and instead of going up like that, it'll go the other way. It goes down. So it goes here, and it's the middle again, then it's the top, and it's the middle. And so that's my trick graph. And notice that when we hit the origin, as we said before, these points are important when we hit zero. So, this is theta. so we, we want to find these guys. So to find the intercept, basically we're going to set this guy equal to zero. And what does that mean? How do we solve for that? Well, not so quick, because the sine inverse has a restriction for where it lives, right? But I want to be able to take all, all possible answers. So what are the possible answers? What's the first one we know about in the first quadrant, right? There's one that happened between 0 and pi over 2. Pi over 6. Pi over 6. Right. What would be the other one? Five power of six, right? Now, if you remember the little pizza pie trick, that's not going to be so bad for you to figure out, right? Because pi over six means you cut pi into six pieces. You want the answer in the first quadrant and the second quadrant. These will be the pieces that are closest to the x-axis. So this is one pi over six, two pi over six, three pi over six, four pi over six, five pi over six. So you're going to take five of the pizza slices, right? Um, 6 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6 would be the guy down here. That's if you were negative a half. You would choose the 7 pi over 6. You could also get the 11 pi over 6, which is over here. That's if you are negative and you wanted the quadrants in the third and fourth, those would be the guys. But we wanted it in the first two quadrants, so those are the guys. So Why do we want it in the first two necessarily? That's where my intercepts are. Oh, okay. Because I have one between 0 and pi over 2, and one between pi over 2 and pi. There's no other intercept I'm concerned with at this point, so I need to find those two. Because right, technically it could continue, but once I go through 0 and 2 pi, it's going to trace out the entire thing anyway, so I don't really need to go further. So now I can sketch the x, y. The numbers that showed up are minus 1, 1, and 3. Right, so I'm going to take the absolute values of all of them and draw circles of those radii. Right, so I have a circle of radius 1, and I have a circle of radius 3. And I'm going to put in the angles that I need. So here's theta equals 0, which is equivalent to 2 pi. Theta equals pi over 2. Theta equals pi. Theta equals 3 pi over 2. Um, I hit zero at these two angles, so I'm going to want to put those in. I'm going to draw that with green because it's not a part of the graph, technically. 
So I'm putting this in my pi over 6, putting that in my 5 pi over 6. And now I can start to draw the graph. So when theta is 0, I start at 1. So I'm here. I hit 0 at pi over 6, so I come here, and I'm at the origin. Then I move to pi over 2. Notice that pi over 2, I'm minus 1. That means I don't go towards pi over 2. I go in the opposite direction on the circle radius 1. And I end up here. Then at 5 pi over 6, I come back to 0. So I'm going to loop back. And I should be at tangent to that angle. Um, at pi, I'm back on the circle radius 1. So I hit that one. At 3 pi over 2, I jump to the circle radius 3. That one. And at 2 pi, I'm back on the circle radius 1. So I close the figure. And what this asked us for was the area of the inner loop. And you might wonder how we're going to find the area of that loop. Well, notice when this loop occurred. It occurred when our theta was traveling between these two angles. Right? You can also see it from the, the picture here. You can sort of tell when the inner loop is going to happen. You see a small valley, right? or a small hill usually represents a smaller loop, whereas a bigger one would represent a bigger loop. Um, and so I kind of know that that's where my air is going to be. So if I didn't even have to draw that graph, I could have, from this, I could know that I'm really taking the integral between this and that. Between, five, between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 is where I created my inner loop. So the area is going to be the integral between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 of r squared d theta. And in this case, my r was that. Pi, pi minus 3 radical 3 over 2. All right, so if you fold it out, do your half angle formula, do all that stuff, you'll get that answer. these is something you have to get used to. You're, you're always graphing two sets of graphs, unless this is like stupidly simple, like some of the examples we did last time. If it's, it's reasonably complicated, you're going to want to graph the trig function on its own, and then sort of translate to the xy plane to get the figure that you want. This is the guy we graphed first, right? What kind of what kind of curve is that? Circle. Circle, radius three. Okay. Centered at the origin. <laughs> Let me run over it quickly anyway, one more time. Um, so 
when you see that, you start doing this. Uh, this is theta. This is r. This is 2. Amplitude is 2. This, 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 this. Um, so that's power 2 pi, 3 pi, 2, 2 pi. And that's a cosine, so it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's here. So that was about real time. <laughs> like, if you're on a test, I want you, I need, I want you to be able to draw it like that fast. Maybe even faster. You guys are younger than I am. <laughs> you, know, you, you have a, a lot of elbow grease. You know, I'm getting too old. Yeah. So you just do that. The trig function part should be something you can graph in 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and then you translate it to the x y plane. Circle of radius two. Three. I was looking at the other equation. Oh, yeah. uh, and circle of radius four. And the angles that we care about are zero and obviously two pi. We also care about pi over two, pi three, pi over two. At zero, I'm at four. I hit two when I'm at pi over two. I hit 0 when I'm at pi, 3 pi over 2, I'm back at 2, and at 2 pi, I'm back over here. And also, we have another guy that's literally the circle of radius 3, that's going to come right in between here. So that's going to be at 3. So what area are we ask, are they asking us about? A little nib on the head. A little nib right here. <laughs> so this is kind of one where we have an outer R and an inner R. The, the thing is now, the only thing is, what are actually the theta values? that I need to integrate in between. Okay. So there's some angle that subtends that shaded region. Um, what angle would that be? Just set them equal. Yeah, just set them equal. It's where they intersect. Um, so um, find intersection. So this means 2 plus 2 cosine theta equals 3, which means your cosine theta equals a half, which means where is it equals in the first quadrant, what's the solution? Pi over 3. Pi over 3. Right? So we know that it's pi over 3 means I cut pi into 3 pieces, which means I cut the bottom half into 3 pieces as well. I want this angle, and I want that angle. So obviously, this would be minus pi over 3 to pi over 3, because I want to increase the angle. Technically, you, one way to describe this angle is to say it's 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, 5 pi over 3. But if you integrate from pi over 3 to 5 pi over 3, you would be getting all of this, right? which we don't want all of that, we want all of this. So I just want to int increase in angle from this point to that point, so instead I take the negative angle. Um, and so this would mean that my area is 1 half the integral from minus pi over 3 to pi over 3 of the outer, outer curve squared, which is going to be that 2 plus 2 cosine Right? It's, the, it's the curve that's farthest from the origin. 2 plus 2 cosine theta squared minus 3 squared d theta. Um, and in here, it's the curve farther from the origin. The curve closer to the origin.
Yeah. yeah uh, so say you were confused on you know whether or not you should be integrated from negative pi over three to pi over three, or pi over three to five pi over three. Would it be a useful strategy to take your in your uh, theta r plane to sort of draw the r equals three line there and find the points like where the two plus two cosine over three is greater than that? Then you would visualize it and see it's negative. Yeah, you can visualize it that way as well. So if I were to draw the r equals three on this, in the r theta plane, r equals three is just a straight line passing through three. So we'll hit this and that. And so another way you can do it. Well, so you don't want that part, right? You want the part that goes to We the want, yeah. you'd want the part that's higher than the line, but lower than the curve. Yeah. So ultimately, you want this piece in addition to that piece. So one thing you could do is you could actually use symmetry. You can find this guy to be pi over 3. Just do from 0 to pi over 3 and double the answer. Right. Or you can realize that um, the geometric equivalent of what, how I thought of it would be to actually just realize that if I extend this graph, yeah. what's over here would be the same thing as what's over there, and this guy would be at minus pi over 3. Yeah. Right. So th there are many ways you can think of it. But just make sure that when you're increasing your angle, it's covering the ones you want. So what, what you can see from this graph is that if you were to go from pi over 3, to 5 pi over 3, right? Moving along the axis, you're covering the middle region, not the region you actually care about. Yeah. So you can actually use a lot of intuition here. And, and in fact, if, if you're asked to find the area, but the problem didn't require you to sketch the curve, honestly, you could actually set up the entire integral just by looking at the first picture. So there, there are some common themes that you'll see here, like small loops are usually going to be things that touch the origin and come back to the origin. Big loops are things that touch the origin, go way over and come back. Like, there will be little things. So you don't have to actually draw it to know where the loop is. You can actually figure it out by looking here. sections. And as I said, and this is in the syllabus as well, I mostly care about the sketching. Um, I don't actually care too much about finding foci and what is the coordinate of the vertex and what is this and what is that. Yes? Is this for 10.4 or 10.5? Conic sections. This is 10.4 and 10.5. Yeah. So do the topic in general, and you have everything in the handout to actually do the topic. I, I think I, I put it together uh, probably better than the textbook. I don't remember how Stewart does it, but I didn't like how an older edition does it, and I sort of compile things from another textbook. Um, but yeah, so it's mostly the sketching. In terms of the equation of a circle, I don't think you guys will have too much trouble with that. We look at circles all the time. But ellipses and hyperbolas are things that you might not know how to sketch very quickly. So those are guys that I would want to talk about, really. Um, in terms of the finer details of the calculations, I wouldn't actually test you on that. But um, if you go through the homework and you're very comfortable on it, I can put it as a bonus problem. But really, I only care about you drawing, being able to draw it. So let's actually do one of those. So I described hyperbolas on this page. And on a hyperbola that opens east and west, we'll have this kind of equation. The difference is the h and k's and the a's and b's will be different. And one that opens north to south will have the y squared first. Notice that there is a subtraction here. Um, ellipses are on the previous page. It looks very similar to how a, a hyperbola looks, except you have a positive sign. And what makes it di the difference of whether it stretches vertically or stretches more horizontally is the denominator. If the larger denominator is under the x, it will stretch horizontally. If the larger denominator is under the y, it will stretch um, vertically. Okay. 
Um, so let's actually. So here's sort of something I, I might do. Okay? So like problem two, for example, is something I would ask. Something like problem one, I wouldn't ask. Really. I've never looked at a parabola and wondered, what's the directress of it? It's never been something that was useful to me. <laughs> or anyone I know. Um, so yeah, so like problem two, where it says identify the conic and state its center. The main techniques we're going to use here is we're going to be completing the square because they usually look like a certain form. Um, so if you look at problem two. <coughs> we're given 9x squared. So this is just basically we're going to do a review of completing the square. Okay, so what do we do? Well, the first step, probably the quickest way to do it, is to group the x's and the y's. Um, more for conceptual psychological reasons. It's nice to just see them right beside each other. Um, we know we want to complete the square for the x and the y, but the fact that this guy has a coefficient is a problem, so what we do is we factor out that coefficient. And so that leaves us with x squared minus 2x. This one here, again, we factor out the 16. This so leaves us with y squared plus 16 goes into 64 four times. Mm -hmm plus 4y equals 71. And remember, to complete the square, what you do, you add and subtract half the coefficient of the linear term, the square of half the coefficient. So I'm going to add <coughs> minus 1 squared and subtract minus 1 squared. Half of 4 is 2, so I'm going to add 2 squared minus 2 squared. So I add and subtract something so it's not changing any value. The difference is you do that because the first three terms will always end up being a complete square. That's just you following the pattern of a complete square. And so that guy is always going to be x plus the inside guy here. So it's minus 1 squared. This item just left over with a minus 1 plus 16. This guy is going to come down and be a y plus 2 squared, and then a minus 4. So this basically becomes 9x minus 1 squared minus 9 plus 16y plus 2 squared minus 64 equals 71. And so I move those guys over. Uh, plus 64, 144, it's a nice number, so that's 12 squared. <coughs> but now what we would do <coughs> is we divide both sides by 12 squared, or divide both sides by 144, so I get 9x minus 1 squared over 144 plus 16 y plus 2 squared over 144 equals 1. Do these guys simplify? Does 9 go into that? It should. x minus 1 squared. 9 goes into that how many times? 16. 16. All right, because this is like 3 times 4 times 3 times 4. So you get left over 2, 4. So that's 16 plus the y plus... 2 squared over 9. Over 9. So the, 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 this guy basically now, you have x minus 1. You'd write it to look like the form on the second page. So this is, I'd write that as a 4 squared and a y plus 2 as a 3 squared. And that you'd write, basically you look through your form machine and realize, oh, that looks exactly like the form for x. <coughs> 
now that you have the ellipse, how do you actually do it? Um, so the main thing you're going to look at first is you know where the center comes from. Now according to those formulas, it's going to be 1 comma minus 2. And so that's sort of where you start plotting. So I'm going to have, there's my graph, x, y. So you start by plotting the center, so that's 1, comma, minus 2. So that's your center. And basically, the ellipse is not that bad. What you do is, under the x, the 4 is going to tell you how far you stretch horizontally. Right? Write it as a square, and so that says from the center you go 4 units that way, 4 units this way. So you're going to go over, duh, 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 and duh, 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 duh. Right? So here it's at 1, so this here is going to go all the way up to 5. And this is going to go back all the way to minus 3. <coughs> the 3 and the y tells you how far you're going the y direction. So it goes up by 3, so that would hit at 1. And it goes down by 3, so that would hit at minus 5. But what you realize here is you end up creating this box. Right? So from the center, which you can identify by what the numbers that are in here, the numbers underneath them, the base tells you how much you move in the x and the y direction respectively. So four, move 4 units on either side in the x direction, move 3 units on either side in the y direction, and you've just created the skeleton for the ellipse. Basically these intersection points here to be the ellipse. It's supposed to look slightly stretched more that way, because you're moving four units in the x while three units in the y. Now, let me do an example. Let's say what if it was a minus instead? Essentially, do exactly the same thing. So you're going to create this. This is like totally lean from the angle I was trying. Like, <laughs> what the hell is that? So you pretty much start exactly the same way. In the case of the ellipse, you find the center one minus two, and you move four units that way, and three units up. And again, you create a little box. The difference between the ellipse and the hyperbola is you now actually draw lines that go through the diagonals. It turns out those are the lines that are the asymptotes for your, your thing. And then you have to figure out, is this opening right to left or up to down? Right? And this is one that opens right to left, right? Because the x is the positive one. And so what that means is you're going to start at this edge here, and it's going to open that way. And the line that you just created here is going to create that symptom. You do a similar thing over here. The signs were switched, you do that up to down. Right? So it's just a matter of recognizing the form that the formula comes in, and then you can sketch it based on that. Um, in terms of sketching circles and parabolas, you guys know how to do that already. I'm not going to really stress that. But knowing how to sketch a head parabola and an ellipse, it's going to be something you need to remember. Um, so we'll stop there, and on Tuesday we'll start with sequences. It's going to be sort of a change of pace. Less calculus and more. Hmm?